The story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to auto theft detail. A gang of criminals masquerading as legitimate auto dealers start to work in your city. Innocent people are cheated out of thousands of dollars. The thieves are clever. They work a foolproof formula. Your job? Stop them. Dragnet. The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, February 19th. It was chilly in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of auto theft. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Nelson. My name's Friday. We were on the way out from the office, and it was 10.25 a.m. when we got to the corner of 38th Street and Maxbury Avenue, the Greenleaf Day Nursery School. Mrs. Uh, Palmer, is that right? Yeah, I think so. Just a minute. I've got it written down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Excuse me, ma'am. Look at the telephone. Police, ma'am. Martin Romero, it's Friday. Oh, yes, Carl. Going to get all about it, is that it? Yes, ma'am. We've been handling similar complaints the last month or so. We'd like to have you tell us everything that happened in your case, if you would, please. One of the most underhanded things I've ever heard of, Sergeant. It would have been the same thing if you'd held me up with a gun. Just out-and-out out robbery. Well, could you give us some of the details, ma'am? How you were first approached on the deal? Excuse me a minute, please. Uh, children, time to go inside now. We're going to color pictures with the crayons this morning. Mrs. Johnson has them all ready for you inside. Bruce, Michael, Sandra, go along now. Inside, everyone. Certainly wish the warm weather would hurry up and come. Children always raise such an uproar when we have to keep them indoors. Worst part of running a day nursery to win a month. Yes, ma'am, I suppose. Now, about your automobile, Miss Palmer, we understand you had it up for sale. You advertised one of the local newspapers, that right? Yes, that's right. I ran one of those three-day want ads over the weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I thought I'd get more for my car if I sold it myself. I mean, instead of selling it to a used car lot. Yes, ma'am. How many answers did you get on your want ad? Well, just the one way it turned out. This man came out and looked at my car first thing in the morning. He offered to pay me exactly what I was asking for it, so I sold it to him. That's just the way it went. Who was this man, Mrs. Palmer? Was he representing some auto company? Yes, he said he was anyway. He gave his name as Joseph Newhall. I've got his card inside. He said he was a buyer for Dan Barton's used car lot on South Cat Street. Nice address, man. He made it all seem so honest. How was the deal arranged? Could you tell us? I mean, transfer the car payment and so forth? Well, he gave me a check for $50, sort of a down payment to hold the car for him. It was a certified company check. I see. He told me he'd be back that afternoon with a certified check for the full amount of the car, $800. Did he take your car with him then? No, he didn't. That's why I had no reason to be suspicious. He left me the check for $50 and said he'd beat her with the money. He said in the meantime, one of the employees from the used car lot might be along to pick up the car to save me the trouble of driving it downtown myself. Mm-hmm. Same M.O. Joe all the way. Yeah, it looks like it. Well, how did it go after that, Miss Palmer? This worker from the used car lot came to the house to pick up the car about 1 o'clock that afternoon. He gave me a check for the full amount of the car, and I gave him the pink slip. He had a pair of white coveralls on, lettering on the back of them, Dan Barton's used cars. Looked like a typical mechanic or something. I wasn't the least bit suspicious. Mm -hmm. How about the buyer, this Joseph Newhall? Did he show up later in the day? No, he never came back. I've never seen him since. Haven't seen my car either. I called that Dan Barton Juice car lot the next morning. They told me they never heard of Joseph Newhall. Just made me sick, officer. I can't afford to lose the money I had in that car. Yes, ma'am, we understand. The same thing's happened to a dozen people like you around the city. Do you remember what this man Newhall looked like, Miss Palmer, his physical description, maybe the clothes he was wearing? Yes, I've got it all written down, Sergeant, in my diary. Would you like to step inside, please? I've got my little office at the back of the school here. All right, thank you very much. I always make a record of everything in my diary. I've kept one ever since I was a girl in college, every day. I suppose you've got all the information on your car, the make, license number, things like that. Oh, yes, indeed. I got everything together I thought might help you. Right up these stairs, please. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, how about the description of the man in overalls, the one who came to pick up your car? 
Would you remember him, ma'am? Yes, I've got that for you, too. Everything I thought would help. Just have a seat there, officers. I've got the things in my desk here. Thank you, Mr. Right Thank you. I wouldn't mind the whole thing so much, but as I say, I can't afford to lose the cash I had tied up in my car. That seems to be the way the thieves operate, ma'am. They've been cheating the people who can least afford it. Terrible thing, just out and out robbery. There you are, Sergeant. Uh-huh. Thank you, ma'am. There's the description of my car, license number, all the rest. Yes, I see. And here's the description of the two men at Joseph Hall and Coveralls who picked up my car. Have you got that deposit check Newhall gave him his bomb and the check for $50? Right here, Sergeant. I saw that company about it, Dan Barton Jews car lot. Forgery. Not worth the paper it's printed on. Uh-huh. Have a look, Joe. Yes, yeah, right. Same as the other. One thing I don't understand, how those crooks get these checks to begin with. Did they steal them? No, ma'am. We figured they had them printed up. We're still trying to find out where. Well, you know what the men look like. You'll be able to find them now, won't you? I mean, we should work that way, ma'am. We've had good descriptions on both men for a month now. Hasn't helped too much. I don't understand it at all. As I say, they're only common crooks. They can't be that smart, can they? Well, there's only one way we can judge. We've been hunting every day for a month now. Yes. They're still... In the space of 33 days, the auto theft gang had victimized a dozen private citizens throughout the city. In each instance, the approach and the method of operation had been the same. The front man for the gang would personally answer a want ad inserted in a local newspaper by a private citizen advertising the sale of his automobile. The front man would represent himself falsely as a buyer for Dan Barton's used car lot, a well-known and legitimate used car dealer. He'd offer to pay exactly the sale price which the private party was asking. As a deposit, the so-called buyer would leave a counterfeit company check for $50 or $100 with a promise that he would return later in the day with a certified check for the full amount. After a few hours, another man posing as an employee of Dan Barton's youth would call for the car and drive it away. Neither the car nor the so-called buyer were ever seen again. All efforts to trace them went for nothing. 11.40 11.40 a.m. Ben and I went back to the office and got out a broadcast and a supplementary APB on Mrs. Palmer's car and also on the phony car buyer who called himself Joseph Newhall. After lunch, we met with Sergeant Newsby, one of the other four men out of auto theft detail who were working the case with us. How'd you make out this morning, Army? That did go anywhere at all? Wasn't bad as far as it went. We found the place where they had the printing done. Yeah, where was that? Small print in the valley. Printed up the phony checks with that heading on it. Dan Barton's used car lot. Got out some business cards for him, too. What was the name? Did you find out? Yeah, the same one, Joseph Newhall. He ordered the checks and the business cards. The printer described him for us, same guy. Where's it go from there? No place. The printer told us Newhall had a car. He couldn't give us a license number. Couldn't even remember the make or the body style. Thought it was a late model car, that's about all. Well, that's not much help. No address on him either. It was a will call order paid for in cash. This is if Newhall comes back, is Uh-huh, it? yeah, it's covered. I don't figure there's much chance Newhall's going to do that. He ordered enough checks printed up the first time last of a year. Well, I guess that's one lead we can forget. Now, how about that special run the stats office made for us yesterday? Anything come out of that? No, nothing. All the possibles on the list were checked out, all mm-hmm. of them clear. Nothing from Barton's used car lot either. Everybody on their staff's been checked out, all their ex-employees, too. No sign any one of them might have had a hand in it. Yeah. Oh, either of you seen the captain since this morning? No, why? Well, that idea we were talking over at the last meeting, he figures we'll go ahead with it this weekend. How's he figure on working, you know? I'm in personal contact? Yeah, that's right. Uh, most of the private parties who want to sell their cars themselves use that want ad deal over the weekend. They get a special ready Saturday and Sunday. Uh, I know. Thursday night's the deadline for having the ads in if they're going to run the full weekend. And that's when we start working on it. We get in touch with every private party who's filed a want ad for the weekend advertising a sale of their car, huh? Yeah, we'll contact them by phone, every one of them. We advise them that if anybody representing themselves as a buyer for Dan Barton's used car lot answers their want ad, they're to get in touch with us right away. If they can't stall the man long enough, we tell them to accept the information on the man the car is driving. Well, it ought to work out. If we can get any kind of cooperation, it's going to be a big job. We'll have to cover all the want ads and all the papers. We've got a good description of that phony buyer, Joseph Newhall. If they planted a want ad in one of the papers, maybe he's the one of the gang who brought the ad in. It's possible one of the ad takers might remember him. Might be worth checking anyway. Well, it could be. They might have phoned in the ad, too. That wouldn't help much. Might as well, it's not foolproof, but it's a different approach. It's a plan, anyway. We've tried everything else we can think of to reach the thieves. I get it. Auto theft, body telling. Yes, sir. Mm Mm-hmm. When was that? Thank you. Yeah, Mm mm-hmm. Yes, sir, as soon as we can. Thank you, sir. 
Well, maybe we won't have to wait for the weekend. What do you mean? A man out in Echo Park. He runs a candy store out there. He advertised his car for sale in this morning's paper. Said the first one to answer it was a buyer from Dan Barton's used car lot. Gave his name as Joseph Newhall. Looks like the same M.O. Mm-hmm. They make a deal? Well, the candy store owner wouldn't go for the deposit check. He wanted the full amount. Said the deal didn't sound right to him. How does it stand now? Well, Newhall said he'd come back with a check for the full sale price. When? Eight o'clock tonight. <laughs> 2.20 p.m. We drove out and questioned the candy store owner further. His description of Newhall tallied with the others, but again, the potential victim had failed to get any kind of a description of the car Newhall was driving or the license number. Ben and I staked out at the house. 8 p.m. came and went. The suspect failed to show. By midnight, there was still no sign of him. Well, the way it shaped up, Newhall apparently had a policy of making a deal at first contact or forgetting about it. He probably figured that if a person was at all suspicious... The interval would give him time to check, and Newhall wasn't giving away any odds. All day Wednesday, the stakeout went on. No sign of the suspect. On Thursday night, the local newspapers gave us lists of names and phone numbers of all private parties who had ordered want ads for the coming weekend to advertise the sale of an automobile. We divided up the names, and six of us took turns on the phones and started calling each party. We warned them about the car theft ring and advised them of what steps to take in the event Joseph Newhall or one of the other gang members approached them with the proposition to buy their car. One of the private parties we contacted was a Mr. Roy Harmon. Ben got on one and got in the ring we'd prepared. Sergeant Ormsby used the other extension and called another party running an ad. Sergeant Ormsby, Los Angeles Police Department Auto. How's that, sir? Yes, and one of the gang usually goes under the name of Joseph New. Contacted it all. Oh, that. Right, thank you, sir. What was that all about? A man by the name of Harmon runs a cocktail lounge out on South Cole. He took in a check over the bar last night, company check from Dan Barton's used car lot. Says it was signed Joseph Newhall. Well, he ought to remember who passed it. He does. I got it right here. Uh, a man by the name of Frank Curtis. He's a regular customer at the bar. Harmon says his Curtis came into place last night with a man in a dark suit, and the man seemed to be a friend of Curtis's. Yeah. Well, I asked him what the friend looked like, and he described him. It was Newhall. Mm-hmm. What about that check business? Harmon says he was tending bar at the time. Told me this Frank Curtis and Newhall had quite a few drinks together and they ran out of money. Newhall wanted to cash a check, but Harmon said no. He didn't know him. Uh-huh. Well, this Frank Curtis is a regular customer at the bar, and he offered to endorse the check for Newhall. So Harmon said okay, and he cashed it. Well, how well does Harmon know this customer of his, this Curtis? Pretty well. Lives across the street from him. We checked Frank Curtis through R&I, but he had no previous criminal record. We left the rest of the list for the other men, and Ben and I drove out and talked to Roy Harmon, the owner of the cocktail lounge where the suspect, Joseph Newhall, had cashed a check with the help of his friend, Frank Curtis. Harmon told the same story he'd given Ben over the phone. Curtis was a longtime neighbor of his and a steady customer at his cocktail lounge. As for Newhall, he'd never set eyes on him until the night before. Harmon gave us the home address of Frank Curtis, and we checked it out. Mrs. Curtis answered the door and told us that her husband, Frank, was working the newly inaugurated night shift at an aircraft plant in the south end of the city. Ben and I drove down to the plant, and after checking with the personnel office, we finally located Curtis at his work. He was an assistant foreman in one of the aircraft assembly shops. It's the truth, Sergeant Romero. The last time I saw Newhall before the years ago. We used to work at a work plant together. Tomorrow, anyway, has he done something? We understand you endorsed a check with Newhall for $50. Do you know him that well? I mean that you'd endorse checks for him? Well, maybe I shouldn't have. Wife's always telling me I'll be more careful who I'm signing checks for. Well, what happened anyway? Wasn't the check any good? Do you have any idea where we could find this friend of yours, this Newhall? Well, I don't know. During the war, he and his wife lived in this housing project off North Main. I know they moved from that place, though. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, old Joe didn't tell me where he was living. I gave him my address, told him to drop over for a beer sometime. Don't remember getting his address, though. Couldn't tell me what this is about, huh? Just a routine check. We'd like to locate Newhall, that's all. Got a few questions we'd like to ask him. Sir, excuse me. We were to watch it here, Sergeant. Yeah. Men coming through with that jig, man. Okay, fellas, straight on through. All clear. Vertical fin assembly down the street. We're getting busy again, all right. Seems like the old swing shift days all over again. Four years. Yeah, you mentioned a minute ago that you all is married, Miss Curry. Yeah, that's right. What about his wife? Can you tell us anything at all about her? Betty? No, no, I don't think so. Her and Joe seem to get along all right. Got along pretty well, matter of fact. Nice girl, Betty. I never minded her much. The Newhalls have any children? Do you know that? No, no kids. 
Let him work. Her aunt, Joe. Uh Uh-huh. Would you know if Newhall's wife is still working? I don't know. Probably is. But yeah, yeah, matter of fact, she is. Joe happened to mention it the other night when we were talking. Just happened to think of it. Well, go ahead. Well, I remember I asked about Betty, and he said she was still working. Same old place, same old job, that's all. Where is this place she works, do you know? Yeah, City Hall. We continued questioning Frank Curtis, and he told us that to the best of his knowledge, the suspect's wife, Betty Newhall, had a civil service rating, and that she'd worked as a file clerk in the record room of one of the bureaus in the municipal... The next morning, Ben and I got in touch with the civil service officials at the city hall. They got out a tracer on the wife of the suspect. 11.20 a.m. I got it. Auto theft Friday. Yes, sir. How's that? Uh, I didn't hear... When? Yeah, I see. Yes, sir. Right. We'll check with you in about an hour. Bye. I don't know why we always have to do it the hard way. Why? Well, why? We call back on Newhall's wife. Most of it checks out just the way Curtis told us. What's her up? Betty Newhall quit her job a month ago. Hasn't been around, hasn't been seen since. Civil service can't even contact her. What's the deal? She moves. No forwarding address. Not a trace of her. <laughs> Ball Road off the 57 Freeway. Light up the holidays with a new vehicle from Anaheim Auto Center. We'll make your holiday dreams come true at Anaheim Auto Center with our incredible savings and huge discounts. Need some extra money for the holidays? Come to Anaheim Auto Center today and save thousands. We have a great selection of new vehicles and unbeatable service. Light up your holiday season today at Anaheim Auto Center. We want you to be completely satisfied. The holidays are the perfect time to buy a new vehicle. Why go anywhere else? We have it all at one convenient location near the Anaheim Pond. So light up your holiday season with a great new car or truck from Anaheim Auto Center. Anaheim Auto Center, we're on the floor. Exit Ball Road off the 57 Freeway. KNX 1070 News Radio. Saturday, February 23rd. The strongest lead we'd had to the auto theft gang began to fade. Mrs. Betty Newhall, the wife of our principal suspect, wasn't to be found. We checked out all our known friends and relatives, the places she was known to frequent. There wasn't a trace of her. Ben got all the available information on her from the Civil Service Office, and we got out a broadcast in the supplementary all-points bulletin. We found out she had a 10-year-old son, so we checked with the Board of Education to see if the boy was registered in one of the city's schools. He wasn't listed. Still no response. We stayed on it. In the meantime, the weekend was wearing past the halfway point. The other two teams of men working the case were standing by, but apparently none of the private parties who were running want ads over the weekend advertising the sale of an automobile had been approached yet by either Joseph Newhall or some other member of the gang. If they did make a contact, it hadn't been reported to us. Saturday night, still no response. 8.50 p.m. Ben and I had some supper at Johnny Coken's place, and then we went back to the office. Not a bad meal at all, huh? Pretty fair for a Saturday night. Good soup. Yeah, there's nothing like that corn chowder Johnny puts out. It's the best. I sure wish you'd do something about that coffee. It's like taking a shot of adrenaline, isn't it? It is pretty strong and... Excuse me. Maybe that's what's giving me this heart burn. Where's Armsby? I thought he was covering. So did I. He was here when I left. Joe, Ben? Hi, Army. Thought we lost you. I'm taking a call from Hollywood Division. Good piece of news. What's that? Newhall's wife. They found her. At approximately 25 minutes past 8 that night, a dark-haired woman in her late 30s had brought a young boy into a pharmacy in the Hollywood area. Apparently, the woman had been drinking, but she was not intoxicated. The young boy with her, whom she identified as her 10-year-old son, was badly cut and bruised about the face and head. The woman insisted that the pharmacist on duty treat the boy and attend to his injuries. After arguing with the woman, the pharmacist called the Hollywood Receiving Hospital. An ambulance was dispatched, and the boy and his mother came there for treatment. At Hollywood Receiving, the woman gave her name as Betty Harrison, and her son's name was George Harrison. But a routine identification check by officers next door at the Hollywood Division Station disclosed her true name as Mrs. Betty Newhall. The desk sergeant ordered her held for interrogation and notified our office immediately. 9.30 p.m., Ben and I arrived at the Hollywood Division. 
Your boy George, Mrs. Newhall, how did he happen to get beat up like that? It's pretty bad for a little fellow. I warned Joe about hitting little George. I told him if he did it again, I'd walk out. Well, I did walk out. I don't care what happens to him. You mean the boy's father did that to him, beat him up like that? He's not George's father. Second marriage. My name is to be Donnelly. I have two kids. One died. Uh-huh. When the divorce came through, I got custody of George, and I married Joe Newhall. You know why we're looking for your husband, Ms. Newhall? Yeah, I think so. Why do you think so? It's car business. I knew what he was doing. Do you have any idea at all where we can find your husband? I'm not sure. He might be a lot of places. Just can't get over what he did to George. No reason at all. Kid came home and asked if he could go to the show. My husband got up and slapped him. Been drinking quite a bit. He hit the kid with his clothes fist, kept hitting. A grown man slugging a ten-year-old kid like that. Yes, sir. I don't care about any man where George is concerned. Nobody's going to treat a kid of mine like that. You said you knew about your husband's dealing in the car business, Mrs. Newhall. How much do you know about it? I didn't have any part of it. I can tell you that much. It was his idea from the beginning, my husband. Got the men together to work the racket. He made all the plans. He gave all the orders. Why was it you quit your job at the city hall in such a hurry? My husband's idea, I guess. He thought if anything happened, he didn't want to be traced that easy. Then he had to go and get drunk that night. Cash that check. He always did stupid things like that. Mm-hmm. How about the gang your husband has working with him, Ms. Newhall? Can you tell us anything about them? Mm, yes, I can. Three fellows working with him I know of. Deadman and Curry Reese and Jack Whitmore. Uh-huh. Maybe there's someone else besides them, but I don't know them. You know where these men live, ma'am? Where we can find them? I think I do, yeah. I got the dresses at home. But this time, they're probably on there. You know the places they were supposed to be staying? Yeah, I got the dresses at home. How about the cars they got on this deal they were working? What are they doing with them? Do you know that? I don't know for sure. They were moving them east, I think, selling them back there. Yes, ma'am. I just always get that the deep marriage of Jolly Hamp could be for... No. Even they didn't like kids. They didn't want to have a home. Why'd they have to be that way? Well, I'd like to ask you something, if I could. Yeah. Why'd you marry him? 10.43 p.m. We stopped at the New Hall apartment on the way back to the city hall, called the office, and arranged for a stakeout. The wife of the suspect, Betty New Hall, gave us the names and addresses of the people she knew to be working with her husband, Joseph New Hall, in the auto theft gang. She had no information to offer on the cars they might be driving. When we got to the office, we took a complete statement from Mrs. Newhall, and then she was booked in at the main jail on suspicion of grand theft auto. 11.09 p.m. Together with Wilson and Ormsby, we started checking out the addresses of the gang members. Our first two stops, we got nothing. On our last two, we did a little better. We picked up a Jack Whitmore, Curly Reese, and a Carl Stedman, three of the names which Mrs. Newhall had mentioned. We took them downtown and booked them in at the main jail. That still left the principal suspect, Joseph Newhall, unaccounted for. At 1.45 a.m. the next morning, we got a tip as to his whereabouts, a small hotel on East 1st Street. We checked it out. The man answering Newhall's description was registered in room 209 on the second floor. We got a pass key from the room clerk on duty and started up the stairs. 209. Down this way, Jim. All right. Yeah, seven. Here we are. Mm-hmm. See if we can get a rise, huh? Yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah, police officers. I'd hold it there, Mr. Down, Ben. Yeah. Hey, what is this? What's this all about? You generally sleep with your clothes on, Newhall? Look, I don't know what you're talking about. What is this? A shakedown? He's clean, Joe. I'll check his bag. Right. Hey, now stay out of those things. You haven't got any right breaking in here like this, going through my property. Let's relax, Newhall. This won't take long. Two full pads of them, Joe. Find them in his suitcases. Company checks. Dan Barton's used car lot. We talked to your friends, mister. We got one side of the story. You want to come downtown and give us yours? You get nothing from me. Not unless I see my lawyer. You can't hold me on any charges. Grand theft auto in Newhall. We've got the witnesses. We've got the evidence. If you've got something to say, say it. If you haven't, we'll get along downtown. You haven't got anything on me. You haven't got enough to hold me an hour. We're going to give it a try. For a full five hours, we questioned Newhall, both at the hotel and later downtown in the interrogation room. And after five hours of questioning, he finally broke and admitted being the mastermind behind the auto theft racket. Your true name is Joseph Willard Newhall, is that right? Yeah, that's it. Now, you can't blame the whole setup on me, though. My wife had a hand in it just as much as I did. Well, we've already got her statement. You want to give us yours? And she's just as much to blame as I am. We didn't hurt anybody anyway. It's just a con deal, that's all. We didn't hurt anybody. How do you figure that? Well, just a simple con deal. People advertising their cars for sale are trying to cheat out a few bucks for themselves. We just outfigured them, that's all. You ready to dictate a statement for us? You know, we outfigured you two. You'd never have reached us if it wasn't for my wife. We'd reach you. Not in 30 years you wouldn't. 
Where'd you go in circles? Just one hitch. That wife and that stupid kid of hers. Just because I slapped him around a little, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. Well, you better learn a lesson, mister. Why? Next time you fight, don't pick a ten-year-old. <laughs> just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On May 29th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. A check of his fingerprints revealed that Joseph Newhall's true name was Joseph Orrin Henderson and that he had a previous record of forgery and burglary in the state of South Carolina. Henderson, alias Newhall, was tried and convicted, along with his associates in the auto theft gang, on eight counts of grand theft and forgery of a fictitious check. They received sentences as prescribed by law. Grand theft is punishable by imprisonment for not less than one or more than ten years. Forgery of a fictitious check is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail for not more than one year, or in the state penitentiary for not more than 14 years. The wife, Betty Newhall, was convicted as an accomplice and was sentenced to serve one year in the county jail. Ladies and gentlemen, our security and the peace of the world are in danger while hundreds of millions behind the Iron Curtain are victims of vicious lies about the United States and other free nations. Join the Crusade for Freedom through your local Crusade Committee or by writing to General Clay, Empire State Building, New York City. Make a contribution to its work. Help truth fight communism. Join the crusade for freedom. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles.